Welcome everyone. My name is Carrie Rosado. I'm the podcast host of Divergent Changemakers. Uh, and today our guest is Evner Duruso. He is known as a motivational speaker on diversity and inclusion. Welcome Evner. Uh, Evner, could you share with us a little bit more about your background and how you got involved with diversity and inclusion? Thank you so much, Kerry, for having me. It's a real privilege to be on your show. And again, as you mentioned, I am a motivational speaker on the subjects of inclusion and diversity. The way I got, and this is a topic that uh, has been in my mind for a very long time. I grew up in Haiti uh, where, I mean, when it comes to uh, division and that is something everywhere you are, whether it's the same group of people, the same social group with the different social groups, we have some kind of uh, division going on. So, and I came here to the US in 1999. I pretty much grew up here, uh, Florida and Massachusetts and got different corporate jobs where I examined how diversity is important in the workplace and also in the workforce. When we look at how you know, companies function, how companies work, and we see a company cannot really compete if they don't, uh, if they don't believe that everyone belong, if they don't uh, include everyone in that progress and that competition. So I got involved in that topic and I wrote this book, uh, which is coming in August, Alike Regardless, uh, this is where it began. In this book, pretty much I highlight the divide and the motives behind, behind the divide. And it's, it's a book that I poured my soul, uh, my mind and spirit into just to make sure that I can uh, change can help change the perspective of humanity when it comes to mankind beautifully said and i, I appreciate you highlighting how uh, in organizations in the workforce it is important to really include everyone uh, everyone uh, deserves equal opportunity so i appreciate that um, i myself do dni consulting with organizations and that's definitely something I try to preach <laughs> for sure um, with organizations to be more inclusive of everyone that they uh, at their organization. Um, could you tell us a little bit more as far as what motivated you to write this specific book? I wanted to challenge the mind of, of mankind to really look at us as human in a different lens. And as you hear and see around the world, there is a, a racial tension and to the point where it, it's becoming a disease, uh, discrimination and racism and bigotry. And we focus so much on, on skin color. We focus so much on gender, sexual orientation. We focus so much on so many things that I believe really matter okay I believe regardless of who we are where we come from uh, the color of our skin we are all human before anything else before we are a man before we are a woman before we are gay before we are lesbian and transgender before we are a millionaire a billionaire whatever social class we are human before any of those things I wanted to send this message to, in the hope of changing the perspective of humankind, to challenge them to understand that that is the principal essence of humanity, is that we are all created equal and that everyone else, the next person is an extension of ourselves. Um, I wanted to highlight, and thank you for sharing all of that. 
Um, some of the topics that you cover in the book, um, I really appreciate how you highlight um, the motives behind a division that exists and also how this, and then you go deeper into chapter four, how this division that exists is actually really unfair. Um, can you talk more about like um, your thought process regarding this? Yes, division is unfair, as I said, because let's say I'm black, right? And this is something that when I was born, I was told that I'm black. I did not make a decision to be black. I didn't make a decision to be 5'9", I mean, as far as my height. I didn't make a decision to be born in, in the Caribbean. No one made that decision to, to be white, black, Hispanics, Asian. It is something that our creator, whoever you believe that is, made for you to be. So division is unfair because we're not responsible for, for any of those things. Because we should look at each other as human, not as uh, you know, white, black. It's just like when I am not in, uh, in the field of agriculture, but when cows, and, uh, and, and animals, they see us, they see us as human, okay? And when, if you don't know these types of animals, when you see them, when you see cows, you just see cows, right? So you don't, unless you, you do a lot of research and you're in the field of agriculture, you would know this is, and this type, this is this breed, this is this type of cow, and the same for any other animals. So we should see ourselves, we should see each other as, as just a human being before we, oh, before we uh, discriminate, before we, we put someone down, before we think lower of another human being. That's why I think division is unfair because no one uh, is responsible or had anything to do with who they are to that respect. Um, I highly agree with that. And um, yeah, it's true. Um, we can't help being born a certain way. And this applies, this goes beyond race. If someone's born with a disability or you, you know, you have a certain sexual orientation, you know, that is who you are. That's your identity, right? And we have no right to judge anyone based on, you know, what makes them unique and amazing. So thank you for highlighting that in the book. And um, I really appreciate also at the end how uh, you make that really strong call to action, that it's time to go beyond just the talking. It's really time to take action and rise up yes. together. Uh, could you talk a little bit more about that? We can hope every day. Uh, since the beginning of times, we've been hoping. We've been hoping change. We've been hearing the word, oh, we we can make the world a better place. But it's time really to act. It's time to really see ourselves in a different lens where we act towards changing the world. Each of us, we should make a decision, make a decision to have a conversation, have a conversation with each other, listen to each other. Although we can disagree, or agree, that doesn't matter. We can always have that conversation about race. We can always have that conversation about uh, diversity and inclusion. At the end of the day, at the end of the day, this world we live in is ours and it is our goal to protect it. And one cannot make the world a better place is when we come together as human being, that we can really work together to make this happen. Thank you for sharing that. I highly agree, definitely. Um, it is time for us to just go beyond just, just the talks and actually put action into place. So thank you for making that call to action in the book at the end.
I'm curious, what are the main key takeaways you want readers to take from this, uh, from the book that you wrote? What I want uh, the readers to take away from the book, they need to, first of all, as I mentioned so many times in the book, we are human and the issue of race, the issue of, of gender and all of those characteristics that we as human, we look at every single day is that these things, they will not help us because we've been focusing on them for for thousands of years. And these things have caused wars after wars. It's time for us to really focus on, on peace and unity and love, most important, love. Because love heals all wounds. And if we really focus on love, knowing that the, the, your neighbor, your brother, the person that, that you work with, the person that uh, you go to school with, whether this person is, is a homosexual, a, a woman, uh, a person with disability, the key thing that you need to understand about this person is that that's a human being. And that our goal in life is to preserve the entire existence of the living race. And we cannot be an island if we don't preserve the existence of the human race. We're not going to have this world. We are going to destroy it. It's going to be self-destruction. Because when this world is destroyed, it's not going to be the blacks destroyed it, the white destroyed it. It's going to be us destroying it. So we need to work together. We need to focus on the principal essence of man, which is to preserve the existence of the entire living race. Well, thank you for highlighting that. Um, and yes, I agree that yes, we all need to do our part and really uh, preserving everyone's rights. Uh, and we are all part of the same human race. And yeah, you really hit the nail on that for sure. I'm curious, um, digging deeper, what have been the biggest challenges that you've seen uh, with, with this space of diversity and inclusion and equity in your experience? I think is the, the workplace, the workplace. Uh, it is true we have so many coaches and, uh, and consultants and, and trainers and every, every big corporation, they have someone that writes training on these issues, but it is still a problem. It is still a problem. And diversity and inclusion is it's more than just policies, programs, and headcounts. When you have a corporation that really respect the unique needs, perspective, and potential of the team members, as a result, diverse and inclusive workplace, they earn a deeper trust and more commitment from the employees. And I have a friend uh, who used to say, if you give them more, you get more. If you appreciate everyone for who they are, you, get, you can get more out of them. So the workplace, the workforce, we need a revolution. We need a big change because we are moving in a very competitive world. It's a very competitive marketplace. And in order for us, in order for companies, for big corporations to excel, small, medium corporations as well, to excel, to scale, 
they need to include everyone because all of us have some unique talents. True, um, I agree that um, organizations can do a better job at addressing uh, this space of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and going beyond just the compliance of trainings and really, really approach it from a more holistic way, how we interact every day with one another, how managers make their decisions in a more inclusive way and don't allow their biases to impact their decision-making. Um, yeah, I agree. It's it's definitely a lot of a lot of work that needs to be done still in the area for sure. <laughs> yeah, because a diverse and inclusive workplace is one that makes everyone, everyone, regardless of who they are and what they do for the business. Whether this person is the housekeeper, whether this person is the one that um, that that work on the books whether this person is the one that makes the phone calls, everyone feel equally involved and in, and in, a, in supported in all areas in the workplace. All, everyone belong. Yes, we all. This is what makes the company, the people. Yeah, the human capital, <laughs> yes. <laughs> human capital. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So in your personal experience, uh, what have been the biggest challenges that you have faced and how have you been able to overcome them or what did you learn from those experiences? I had a few uh, experiences. I, I was uh, in retail management for a long time. And a short story, uh, which I don't explain in the book, I thought that was that was very, a bit heavy. My first management job, I worked for a large retail drugstore chain, and I was a I was a manager. And one day, there's this cashier. Uh, he is, of course, Caucasian. He said something to me that really, really shocked me. He said, look at me, I'm white. And look at Mr. D, they called me Mr. D, uh, because my last name, Dorso. Look at Mr. D, he's black and he's Haitian and he's my boss. And life is so not fair. Stop for a for about 10 seconds and I and thought about it. I'm like, wow, this is why they talk about these terms such as white privilege. Because he believes because of the color of his skin that he should be in that position regardless of someone else might earn that position. And, and we see it every day. And if, even if those statements are not made, but we see those in the workplace where people think that women shouldn't, should be, shouldn't be CEO of Fortune 500 corporation. That people feel that uh, uh, homosexuals cannot be athletes. You know, we see it every single day in our world in the entertainment industry, in the uh, athletic industry, where people feel that certain groups shouldn't deserve to be in certain positions. And that experience led me to, to really start writing, to really start coming in ways that talking about ways that we can challenge people to understand that really when it comes to intelligence, all of us, we have some type of intelligence. I'm not saying that we all, all of us are smart and at the same level, 
but we all have something to contribute in the world. We all intelligent in our own way. We are all smart in our own way, regardless of our race, regardless of where we come from. That's very true. We all have something uh, to contribute. We all have those unique abilities um, and we all have something to bring to the table. And I think, I thank you for highlighting the importance of that. I appreciate it. Um, are there any myths that you would like to clarify or debunk that people might have regarding diversity, equity, and inclusion and belonging? What I'd like to clarify when it comes to diversity, and let's talk about the, the workplace, uh, for example, and how that is important. Uh, a lot of research uh, show many benefits of, uh, of a diverse and inclusive workplace. And, and I believe if companies, whether small, medium, or large, they really include diversity and inclusion uh, in the mix, they will have higher revenue growth and greater readiness to innovate. Also increase ability to recruit a diverse talent pool, as I just mentioned earlier. And a lot of some research shows that 5.4 times higher and uh, higher employee retention. And inclusion in the workplace is one of the most important key to retention. And I, in my experience in, in retail, we have different people that come in to, to, to buy stuff from the store. So if we have one group of people serving, when certain people come, they feel like they don't belong to your store. They don't, they feel like that, that you, your product or your service is not for them. You have to create an environment, a space for everyone to say, hey, you know what? Oh, if I go to, to Walmart, I am going to see someone that I can relate to someone that looks like me, someone that shares some type of culture with, with me. And also, which is one of the point that, that, we, that we don't have to really focus on is cultural competence, which I think very important as well. Because sometimes uh, I, I go to um, to the clinic and people asking certain questions that I, according to my culture, that I believe to be offensive. All right. For example, if you go to the doctor and they ask you, "What is your religion?" Okay. And I remember when I first moved to Oklahoma. And uh, I was uh, calling uh, uh, a doctor's office to, to get a physical. They asked so many questions. And, and many of those questions that I believe that they should not ask people because they have nothing to do with any medical treatment. Of your religion, where you go to church, these things don't really matter. So it's all so many things that there are a lot of voids in our system that really we need to, to take a deep look into because the individual is not the problem, is a system that we need to change. So the voids are in in the system. So once we fix our system, once we fix 
the policies, the fix, the rules that we've been using for so many years to include everyone, regardless of where they come from, we can really see change in a very positive way. Yes. Um, I believe so. That's very true. Um, it definitely is a systemic problem that needs to be addressed and um, it's, it's very broken and it will take time to, to achieve it. But I think if, if we start now together, uh, yeah, pe yeah, people can definitely make change together. Um, all the time. It may not happen in my lifetime or your lifetime, but sure. it would happen. <laughs> So I'm curious, um, any final thoughts uh, that you'd like to share with the audience as far as where they, how they can stay in touch with you to learn more about your work, but also where they can find your book uh, when it's being released, if it's already been released, uh, what's the format? Yeah. Yes. And first of all, thank you so much for having me on your podcast. And it's, and I think you're doing a fantastic job, you know, bringing this content to your audience. For information about me, you can go to my website, ivneadurso.com. Ivnea is Y-V-E, Y as in yes, V as in Victor, E-N-E-R, Dorso, D-U-R-O-S-E-A-U, which is my full name, dot com, where you will find information about the release, which is in August 23rd, 2021. And, and also I have articles that I post and videos as well. And you can also find me on social media, Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, and as well as the clubhouse under I am Evener uh, as the handle. And reach out. Uh, go to my website, send me a message. I'd be happy to talk to you, uh, have a conversation with you. I'd be happy to come to your community, uh, to speak to your community, because it is something that we all can work together. We have that conversation, encourage each other to engage in that conversation. And this is how we can really create this better world that we've been hoping for a long time. Well, thank you for sharing that. And thank you to our audience for listening. So definitely keep a lookout for the book coming out in August. And thank you for being a guest uh, on Divergent Changemakers podcast. And that is a wrap. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Carrie, for having me. Again, a like regardless. This is where it began coming August 23rd, 2021. Thank you so much. Thank you.